Welcome to Dialogue. G20 economies have seen strong recovery in the third quarter. But the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development said world economies still remain below pre crisis levels. So, when will it be back on track? And as Chinese policymakers map the country's economic future, what are their priorities? To talk about these issues, I'm happy to be joined in the studio by Professor John Gong from the University of International Business and Economics. And by Skype, we'll talk to Joël Rouet, chairman of the Bridge Tank in Paris, and Steve Keen, crowd founded professor of economics on Petron in Bangkok. That is our topic. I'm Zhou Yue. Uh, but John, uh, more than 8% of rebound in GDP among the world's 20 most strongest economies. What does this figure say about the global economy right now? Well, it only says that it's much, much better than the second quarter. It's actually a rebound from the second quarter. Mm. Second quarter experienced a very deep, steep, steep, steep decline. For example, in India, it's like you know, minus 25%, right? So uh, it's the rebound compared to the second quarter that we see in the third quarter is much, much better. Mm. That says that you know, during this time between uh, July and uh, June, August, sorry, July, August and, 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 uh, and the second quarter, third quarter, right? Um, the economy is much better than the second quarter. But remember, the fourth quarter, starting from the fourth quarter, we are seeing the pandemics coming back, actually, mm -hmm. right? We call it the second wave. Uh, so I, I would say it, it hasn't, you know, this, this pandemic is not over yet. We're, we're, we're way not over yet. There are still a couple of months ahead before we can talk about really economic you know, recovery. Um, in the vaccines, it takes some time for them to uh, take effect. Um, so uh, it, it, I would say it's way too early. And Mr. Zhuwei, what do you think? Uh, the economic data, is it just a quarterly growth? It will come back uh, because the fourth quarter, we have seen the resurgence of COVID. Mm. Well, uh, thanks for inviting me. And uh, you know, let us be so far happy with this figure because what we call a rebound was not necessarily deemed to happen. At least, not in a, a, not at the same time everywhere on the planet. You know, we could have had no rebound in some economies, which could have been more devastated by uh, the first lockdowns. First of all, if we have. 8% at the G20 level, that means all the G20 countries are experiencing a rebound. And the second point is that while all are experiencing a rebound, they are experiencing a coordinated rebound. And remember, just a few months ago, we were worried that the rebounds would not be taking place at the same time, which in the case of interconnected economies with trade, uh, intra-firm uh, external trade for the multinationals and coupling of economies would have been a disaster. So the fact that we have not only a rebound, but a kind of simultaneous rebound is good. And I think this shows somehow that the coordination across the G20 economies has worked. So we're not yet over with this crisis. I'm not so optimistic with the future, but first of all, we have a good news uh, with this coordinated figure. Uh, where it has been uh, rebounding and, and, and how is also a big question because according to OECD, all G20 economies have seen positive growth. France, Italy, Turkey, uh, UK, South Africa and, uh, and Mexico posted double digit growth. What stands out is probably India. India experienced the strongest growth 21% rebound, but that happened after a 25% second quarter drop. That is the largest drop in history. Right. This kind of a fluctuation, is it a good thing? Well, a fluctuation is never a good thing, and in, with these huge figures, it's not like a minus compensates a plus, or a plus compensates a minus. A minus more than 20% means uh, uh, that some assets have been destroyed, that some know-how has been lost, that some companies uh, along the way must have closed. So this uh, will never be recovered, or this will take a lo long time to recover. You know, the, the kind of rebound you get through consumption does not, uh, does not pace out for what you've lost in terms of economic structure. This is one thing. The second thing is that, the second question is, 
at which cost doesn't come. Uh, in India, uh, you were referring to India, Narendra Modi has put a huge stimulus package. He's put all his kind of last forces, last resources of the country have been put into this uh, stimulus package. So we will know in a couple of quarters, maybe three quarters, whether this uh, package is enough to uh, produce long-term reforms or will have just turned out to be a kind of a short-term stimulus package on, on consumption. Mm. A, a rebound cannot be based just on consumption, investment, reforms, restructuring the economy just the way uh, China is doing currently is also important. Uh, let's talk about India a, a little bit more because according to the OECD it has expressed confidence in India's economic performance saying its growth is expected to compete with China and according to uh, Euromonitor International Global Research Company India will lead the world with economic recovery. But uh, still a lot of people, John, are saying India's economic rebound is not so solid because there are still problems of COVID rampaging in that country. Yeah, well, the, the, the OECD uh, report talking about India performing better than China, talking about next year actually, right? Uh, but this is assuming that the pandemic is gone. So if the pandemic is gone, India is supposed to be performing better than China. That's actually harder than any news to me. I mean, India's growth figure was actually higher than China's last year, right? So pre-pandemic time, India is already growing faster than China's. And there's a reason behind this, because China's growth figure, if you can you know, look at the historic trend, it's been climbing down, to, uh, uh, climbing down, climbing down steadily. It's not surprising because we're so large now, right? So of course, you know, there's a sky is the limit, and China's uh, growth figure is expected to come down. So you know, for I think for a year or two, India has been like one percentage higher ahead of us mm. um, for this period of time. So moving forward, after the pandemic is gone, assuming you know we're going back to normal in 2021. Um, I would expect the same trend that India's economic growth figure would be maybe, you know, a percentage point higher than China's. Uh, and also, uh, we understand the next year's economic growth will be a big question mark for the world. According to OECD forecast, the world economy would regain momentum with 4% growth next year, return to pre-pandemic levels. Mm -hmm. I think that prediction is probably based on COVID is well contained, vaccination right. is working perfectly right. well, but is that assumption probably too early, too mature? <laughs> uh, well, I, I would still uh, give uh, these forecasts the benefit of the doubt. You know, I still have a lot of faith in uh, the vaccines coming from the U.S., coming from China, from, from, from U.K. Um, so, um, it, it, you know, if, if you look at the experience in 19... 19 Spanish flu, for example, it disappeared very rapidly. All of a sudden, just gone, right? And the economy came back with but a But it still strong. took two years for that uh, it, it, to pan out. It's, it's, it's 18 months, actually. Uh, 18 months, a year and a half. Uh, and we're not that far from that. <laughs> we're already a year, right? So, uh, you know, six months left. And, and we also have the, the new technologies that at the time people don't ha didn't have it, uh, you know, during the Spanish flu. Um, in the 1918, 1919 time frame, um, with the vaccines, with the new technologies, with with the quarantine, you know, uh, methods, with our mask wearing, social distancing, contact tracing, all these technologies, I would expect that uh, you know we should be in a better, much better, better, better position in dealing with the pandemic uh, this time around. And Joe, are you uh, similar, <coughs> optimistic about the world economy next year? Well, first of all, I think John was right to go back to, to return to the pre-COVID-19 uh, fundamentals because, you know, the uh, world growth and the G20 growth is driven by China and, and by India. By China because of the size of China, even if growth is slowing down structurally and had been slowing down structurally before. So after China readjusts, uh, China will become a driver. And as far as India is concerned, the share of India in the world economy and the share of India in trade is less. But with such a high growth, the contribution to global growth uh, by, by, by India's growth is, is important. And if we look back to, uh, to, 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 to the fundamentals uh, before the COVID-19, I think India will be the crucial point. I'm not worried for China. I'm not too worried for uh, the EU or for uh, US provided 
the cost of the stimulus package can be absorbed, but for China, uh, for India, sorry, India had structuring problems that remain. Those structuring problems are two. Uh, first of all, uh, what we call the missing middle, the yeah. contribution of uh, small and medium enterprises to exports is limited. Okay. If you look at India's exports, uh, three-fourths of India's exports represent, uh, fall into products and services that represent only 30% of the world trade. So that means that for 70% mm -hmm. of the world trade, India is under-exporting. And the second issue is restructuring uh, uh, the, the labor market. And for that, not much has happened pre-COVID, and this will be even more difficult post-COVID. So I'm globally optimistic, but the country to watch is India. And since you mentioned the labor problem, uh, recently there are workers in Foxconn com companies in India striking uh, against the authorities. It seems that problem will be laid bare, especially after COVID, when the poor people are, are, are more in, uh, under intense pressure. Well, uh, Prime Minister Narendra Modi has recently announced a, a universal uh, safety net, universal health, but this seems to be a kind of a last minute in a hurry policy which, has, which lacks a base, you know, which lacks a history in the development of the country where uh, the structure, the machinery of the state would be supporting that. The, the state structure is not ready for that. Uh, the financial sector has not opened uh, and developed into this direction either. So I think this is going to take time. Mm. Uh, this is an issue that China knows very well. Chinese reforms have been at it for the last 10 to 15 years. We know it takes time. So I'm optimistic for, Ch for India uh, in a span of time of 5 to 10 years. But the next 2 to 3 years will be absolutely crucial for India and for uh, the rest of the world, as and, I said. And, and who do you think will be leading uh, the economic rebound in 2021, and in what way? Well, you know, I'm speaking from Paris, and I'm a an European, so maybe I might be having a bias in what I'm going to say. But uh -huh. I really believe that the green uh, contents, the greening contents of the European package, European package, the, the EU uh, stimulus package, that uh, it, uh, it will be very important. I really believe that the fact that we've adopted a long-term seven years joint budget uh, is very key uh, under this uh, uh, under-analyzed uh, structuring reforms. The fact that uh, the last EC uh, uh, European Commission Council uh, on the last on, uh, on the last of the tenth of December. Uh, declare that it's ready to resume discussion with America, uh, that we are currently in Europe negotiating yeah. a, a, an agreement on investments with China, on which I'm reasonably yeah. hopeful. I think this place is there will probably Europe. synergy coming out of, uh, from it, Europe, it, China, and America because of different political environments, especially in North America. Well, uh, the good thing in that is that Europe has decided not to choose would we have to choose? This would be a lose-lose uh, scenario. Uh, either North America or China would lose, and we would lose in any case. So as we don't want to have to lose in any case and, uh, by having to choose, we've decided not to choose. Uh, President Macron, Chancellor Merkel, uh, followed in that by the leaders in Italy, in Spain, in the Netherlands, uh, are, are firmly standing on trying not to choose. One recent development was against the GAFAs, mm. uh, trying to regulate the economy of the GAFAs, and putting that within the G20 framework, I think Europe is back in, in, in some way. All right. Thank you, Joe. Uh, uh, and let's come back to you, John. Uh, so China is, some say, is out of woods, and it is on a solid path of recovery. Right. But uh, will that trend continue in 2021, when the rest of the world will also be back on track? Some people would argue exports uh, from China will decline when their economy come back online. Well, no, I totally disagree with that. I think the current trend is going to continue, and particularly after the pandemic, um, you know, the economic recovery is going to be very strong. Um, we, think about this. We are already uh, doing quite well in the third quarter, and I would expect the fourth quarter of this year's number will be excellent, uh, maybe even north of you know, 6%, maybe even close to 7%. Now, this is happening. 
against the backdrop of the rest of the entire world is in big trouble right now, right? Mm. Um, so we have developed all these mechanisms of containing, you know, this, this imported uh, uh, infections at entry points, um, and, and we've done, you know, very well with respect to that. We, you know, we have a couple of our small outbreaks, and quickly we will be able to contain that. We, we, we sort out the, the source and, and, and do this quarantine work. Um, so now, if the rest of the world is, is back to normal, you know, we don't have this hassle again, right? So, um, and, and um, you know, historically, again... But they were buying less from China because their own capacities is catching up. No, I think Chinese exports are still very, you know, very competitive. Uh, and besides, you know, exports is a small portion of China's economy, 17, 18 percent at most, right? Mm. Um, and if you take away exports related to uh, pandemic, for example, uh, and if you take away even exports as a result of you know, what you're saying, that uh, because other countries' exports or production capacity has been affected and Chinese products have been becoming uh, competitive, maybe you take away that. I, I would say it's a small portion in the grand scheme of things, it's a percentage of total GDP. Mm. It's very small. It could be easily made up by stronger demand in domestically, for example. Um, so, and, and also we're you know, doing a lot of investment as well. So, um, you know, if you do the calculation, I think that's a small figure. Um, so, uh, again, I want to refer to history. Historically, after the big pandemic, the economy is usually okay. very strong, usually very strong. And it's, it's very strong for an extended period of time, actually. Uh, also about the priority of China's economic work in mm -hmm. 2021. Mm -hmm. uh, because this weekend, China will have an economic work Conference. Right, it's very important. Right. And then there are several messages that are already being uh, spreading around. One is that we will not only focus on structural reform mm -hmm. of supply, mm -hmm. but, uh, but also demand. Demand side, right. What do you mean, what do they mean by demand side reform? What kind of demand will there be? Well, I think the demand side reform really means it's the adjustments of uh, um, uh, uh, demand in, in certain ways that uh, satisfy consumers. Uh, I think our overall consumption pattern is going through an upgrade trend. Um, and also, um, the, 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 you know, they also emphasized, for example, on this, you know, the importance of um, industrial production. Uh, as well as uh, innovation-led growth. So, you know, these are the areas that are going to be, you know, heavily, heavily emphasized. Um, I think the, the adjustment of demand is, um, is long overdue. I mm -hmm. think, uh, you know, we have seen so far is that mostly uh, for uh, what we call supply-side adjustment. Uh -huh. Supply-side adjustment really means the curtailing capacity, actually, yeah. as you understand, right? So I think, um, I think we're now switching to the mode of um, trying to create more demand, uh, trying to optimize demand such mm. that these capacities can be absorbed <coughs> and, and the mismatch between demands at an aggregate level uh, could be mitigated. And Steve, uh, what do you think of China's uh, economic policy messages? Uh, one is demand side reform. The other uh, we'll talk about later probably is uh, anti-monopoly. I'm well, actually more in favor of the former than the latter. I think uh, the, the, the negative picture that monopolies have uh, is, is partly due to a, a bad economic theory. Uh, you, you get monopolies where economies of scale are overwhelming and that applies in quite a few industries. But I think in general China has to reorient itself towards more domestic consumption, less reliance upon exports. It's, it's achieved its industrialization objectives well and truly from those that were set by Deng Xiaoping so many years ago now, and it's now a chance to focus upon China for Chinese uh, needs rather than actually needing the export dollar as much as used to be the case. And uh, the recent uh, pact signed between Asia Pacific economies, what we call uh, RCEP, uh, will that be helpful uh, to boost consumptions here in China? What does it mean for the other economy, Steve? Well, I think anything that uh, it has China working on a regional basis is better than the focus upon international trade. Uh, we're going to go through some serious changes courtesy of climate change, and they'll force us to you know, cut back on massive sources of carbon dioxide rapidly, and one of those is international trade with container vessels and bulk shipping, which is a large component of our carbon uh, footprint for the planet as a whole. That has to go. And I think in that case, focusing upon more of a regional emphasis, less travel, uh, less shipping of goods is better for the planet and that will also be better for China. Uh, I still want to talk about the anti-monopoly policies uh, that we've seen okay. recently. Uh, let's 
first uh, hear your thoughts, John, uh, because the Chinese tech companies, they've been enjoying remarkable progress thanks to very lenient, should I say, regulation environment. Uh, that's why they've grown bigger. That's why they've brought a lot of profits and also convenience for consumers. Why is it necessary to regulate them? Yeah, I'm exploring that actually. <laughs> I'm also involved in a lawsuit right now, in, 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 in a somewhat related to that. Um, I think it is a historical background. Um, we have an anti monopoly statute that was enacted in um, 2008, it's been almost uh, 12 years so far. Um, and historically, um, the regulatory authorities have been, um, the competition authorities have been you know, taking sort of, sort of a very convenient attitude towards the growth of these internet companies. Uh -huh. We're mostly talking about these internet companies, the big players, the, what it, what's described as the platform companies, right? Um, so what these co platform companies be? Because we wanted to see rapid growth. Um, exactly. Well, first of all, we want to see, you know, this is a new phenomenon, we want to cultivate sort of a new technology development, and, uh, and it's also actually a very important argument, what's called the dynamic competition. You know, it's kind of a Schumpeterian argument that in this industry, there's no market equilibrium. It's it's you know it's 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 competition, <coughs> uh, cutthroat competition. You know, mm. It's a winner takes all kind of argument. Mm. Um, and 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 also, there's also you know what Schumpeter's been saying is the perennial gale of disruptive co of uh, it's disruptive creation, right? Mm. Um, so um, this you know, but have we passed the stage? It is. That's what more I'm destructive than creative. At <laughs> that, this that's, that's what I'm talking about. Uh, now we are starting to see these companies becoming bigger and bigger. Not only they are becoming bigger, they are also uh, expanding into related areas. Right? You start out with e-commerce. Now you're getting to payment. You're getting to fast delivery. You're getting to you know inventory management, and then you know advertising. Now we're making loans. So they are getting to the posing banking business. challenges to <laughs> systematic stability. Um, I think at a certain point we, have to, you know, we need to draw a line in the sand that you know, enough is enough you know, because they're being not only becoming so big, they're becoming so big in many other areas, right? So uh, you know, they're becoming like an infrastructure company. So you know, with, with respect to infrastructure company, that it's really concerning um, national economic security at this point. But if it's so a good infrastructure, why should we? Keep it down. Well, because of lack of competition, because of uh, some of the practices that are subject to dispute. You know, I, I'm involved in one lawsuit right now that that's okay. you know concerning a kind of a behavior uh, adopted by one very large company. That's very questionable, right? So uh, it's the it, it, the term you know in our field is called abuse of market dominance, basically. Uh, Article 17 of anti-monopoly law. Uh, there are certain behaviors that other companies can do, but you as a uh, uh, company that enjoys market dominance, no, mm. you cannot do that. You know, it's kind of this kind of okay. things that uh, wow. uh, ultimately it's, it's really the wow. harm to competition that's, uh, uh, that's questionable here. Interesting. Yeah. And, and Steve, uh, <coughs> it seems that you have some other thoughts on this. Yeah, I mean, economic theory pushes this vision that uh, the best economy, uh, mar market is a market with lots of very small firms, and that fits their model of power dispersal. Uh, when you look at the real world, and say, would that actually be more efficient? Imagine 100 Googles uh, or 1,000 Facebooks. Uh, the network effect that we get from aggregation is actually strongly beneficial quite frequently to consumers. Mm. Plus also, when you look at where competition actually comes from, it doesn't come from a myriad of, of, uh, of small firms all much the same size. It tends to come from one small firm seeing an enormous opportunity uh, that is only presented by the fact that there's a big one there in the first place. And, uh, and so it, it's, it's, I think the Schumpeterian vision your other uh, speaker is uh, mentioning is quite, quite the correct way to think about it. You want to have a system where there's innovation occurring regularly and the, the blanket idea that getting rid of uh, monopolies will, will improve the mm -hmm. economy actually is totally tangential to the idea of, of enhancing uh, uh, technical, technological innovation. So I think uh, we, we should throw out the American approach to that, but do look at things like market <laughs> dominance and, uh, and often the, the need to and regulate some of these structures. And it's become a global practice, well, not only here in China, 
in Europe and North America, yeah. no, we, they've we, all been trying to ring we, in those we, big conglomerates. We, in well, we have to be very careful. Now, I'm, I'm not saying that you know, we, uh, monopoly by itself is not illegal. Okay, let's put it this way: um, monopoly by itself is it can happen in many ways. It could happen because of patent. It could happen because of luck. For example, Microsoft came into pretty much a, um, a monopoly kind of a position because of uh, you know okay. some talents. Uh, but the point is that abuse of that position, mm -hmm. abuse the behaviors, right. abuse that position. That, that topic deserves a whole program to talk about. <laughs> okay. uh, there's another thing I want to mention uh, that is the. Uh, the COVID crisis has laid bare another problem, an economic problem and a social problem, that is inequality. Because uh, uh, mm. according uh, to the UN, COVID-19 pushes millions of people, to be exact, 88 to 115 million people to the brink. And the World Bank said that 9% uh, of the world be living under 1.9 US dollars per day. It seems that will be a big challenge for economic planners and decision makers all over the world, Steve. Uh, yeah, I mean, inequality has been, it, it, obviously, da the data has shown it's risen quite dramatically in the last 20 years. Uh, government policy has actually probably made that worse, particularly quantitative easing, for example, has made the wealthy wealthier. Uh, and so we have had a huge number of policies that pretend we live in a meritocracy when, in fact, there's enormous inequality coming out of power and the power that particularly causes that is the power of the financial sector. So I would like, I'm pleased to see a focus on inequality but a much faster way to reduce that inequality is to reduce the level of private debt to what I've called the modern debt jubilee and mm -hmm. I think that's necessary now to avoid a financial crisis after COVID particularly for countries like America and Europe which have handled it so badly. And John, do you think China is also facing the problem of growing I, I, inequality it, I, and that will affect this is policy? A this is a universal problem. It's also a historic problem. Again, I refer to refer back to history. After 1918 Spanish flu, you know, there's a distributional effect that economists have detected. What it means is that the, the more advanced economists did very well, um, the, the, the poor economists did poorly, the, the rich people did much, much better, the poor people did much better. Uh, President-elect Joe Biden was talking about that K-shaped uh, return, <coughs> uh, recovery, right? He said K-shaped recovery. That's what he's talking about. Uh, in America, there are people who are doing very well, that people actually do not. But I think, um, it, to some extent, this is also happening in China. I think, yeah. uh, you know, we're, we're starting to see these things happening. Uh, people who, uh, you know, usually they are relatively, uh, you know, not wealthy, they are poor people. Um, the working class people, you know, they, they tend but to... But so the policy makers that, have that in mind. I think they? that's very important. I think the, this is exactly the point. You know, I think we should learn from the history the, the, to learn that lesson that there's this K-ship recovery thing, that, you know, helping the poor, helping the people really struggling right now is part of the policy agenda. Yeah. Uh, and I think uh, it's, it's, it's uh, absolutely I'm convinced we're fortunate that we have a government that's having this in mind. Right. The president is talking about people-centered economic growth. So these people are certainly on his mind. Growth is important and distribution is also important. Thank you very much, John, and thank you, Steve. Mm -hmm. And you've been watching Dialogue here on CGTN. I'm Zhou in Beijing. Thank you so much for watching. Goodbye. Science has never been more important than now. What is the major difference of being a scientist from being an average person? Scientists, they are working on what we do not know. A good scientist is wrong 90% of the time, and a really good scientist is wrong 99% of the time. What is scientific spirit? Ability to judge scientifically. Uh, judge correctly. Science is the discovery of the truth. Science needs to be a problem solver. Science can enlighten our lives.